Hey now, and welcome to the City Off Campus with your two favorite hosts, Sammy Sommerfeld and Jack McFarland. We've got a special guest today. We've got former Minnesota Vikings Chief Marketing Officer and fellow Iowa Hawkeye Steve LaCroix on the podcast. Um, so Steve, my first question for you is, what was your experience as an Iowa student like, and what did you enjoy about being an Iowa Hawkeye? That was great. I mean, Iowa City is awesome. You know, I grew up in Peoria, Illinois, so just a couple hours across the border, and, and uh, it was a long time ago, graduated in 1990, but uh, it was a great four years on campus, and met my wife there. She's from Des Moines, and uh, we have two kids that are both Hawkeye grads, so we're, we're a full Hawkeye family uh, living in the Twin Cities and, and enjoying it. That's awesome. So how did going to Iowa help you in your career path in sports business? And why did you want to go into the sports industry? Yeah, it took me a little while to figure that out. I actually went to Iowa as part of the engineering program and uh, that didn't go so well. After a year and a half, I finally figured out it wasn't, wasn't my calling. So I switched over to the business school. And right about that time, there were just a handful of, of graduate programs that had sport management masters and and fortunately, Western Illinois University, which is right between Iowa City and my hometown of Peoria, I was one of the programs and I was able to get in on that and, and really focus more so on and sports as a specialty. And, and then was fortunate enough to land with the Indiana Pacers as my first uh, uh, internship, which led to 10 years there and now 20 years at the Vikings. How does, how does um, a kid from college get an internship with the Pacers and then find a career with the Pacers? Like I never, I never really think a lot of people see that coming. And I really don't think a lot of people, once they're in that position, uh, look forward and see that 10 years with the Pacers. Did you see yourself really sticking with that organization and, and in the sports industry at that point? Or was it just something you were happy to be a part of? Well, certainly happy to be part of it. I, I, I wore my wife, Sue, and she's a retired pediatric nurse, you know, very stable, uh, you know, noble profession. And I'm like, okay, we're going to have to move around a lot. We're getting into professional sports. And first I had to convince her that pro sports was an actual job, you know, as, as far as the way to make a living. And, and we actually visited with the Pacers as well as uh, other teams in the Indianapolis market, as well as Chicago market on kind of a barnstorming tour with some other students. And something just clicked. It just it was a great few hours with the Pacers and, and just pursued them for an internship. I was fortunate enough to be uh, one of six interns for the, the, the summer ticket sales program and, and then was, was lucky that they had some openings uh, at the right time. They had not had uh, any new hires and ticketing in, in several years and just you know a little bit of dumb luck on timing. But once I got in there, I was like, hey, this is what I want to do for, for a career and, and worked hard at it and uh, learned how to sell, learned how to take rejection. Uh, back then, it was a lot of cold calling on the phone with paper lead lists, and and uh, every once in a while, somebody may call you back, and you just had to kind of learn on the fly and and try to get them excited about Pacers basketball and spending their hard-earned money on on tickets. How were you able to make yourself stand out in those early years um, and let your hard work speak for itself and be noticed within the Pacer organization? And how were you able to work your way up into an eventual position with the Minnesota Vikings? Yeah, I mean, it was a lot of hard work. I mean, you had to prove yourself and, and close close deals. So you had you know, any time you get hired for for a sales position, you have to build it to create revenue and add on your sales totals and and just worked hard. You know, networked within the front office, tried to learn about other departments. Uh, I don't want to necessarily do ticketing for my full career, but it was a, a great entry point into into the industry and and uh, really respect those that, that do that for a living. It's 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 hard work. And it's, uh, you know, convincing people to give up their valuable time to come to games, especially in baseball, where there's 81 home games, obviously NFL, we have eight regular season games and two preseason games and uh, potentially next year, nine, nine home games, depending on how the rotation works with the 17 game season. I uh, just worked, uh, worked hard and was able to convert over to uh, sponsorship sales and then was involved with our, our new arena in the late 90s and uh, led all the main partnerships on that and then was managing the department uh, of sponsorship sales when, when the Vikings came calling and, and took a little bit of a risk to move to, to Minnesota, still Midwest, but upper Midwest. And, and uh, we do have some family up here. So that was a, a nice transition uh, and really just 20 years flew by and, and took us a long time to get that new stadium approved. We finally opened in 2016. Ownership group that uh, hired me initially and then sold a team a handful of years later. So made it through that transition and just had a great run of building a stadium, hosting a Super Bowl, 
uh, opening a new practice facility on a 200 acre campus. So it was a, a real exciting and, and fulfilling journey uh, over those 20 years. One thing I wanted to touch on specifically with that uh, stadium uh, project that the Minnesota Vikings had, um, what were some unique challenges that you and your team had faced when transitioning all of the game day activities from um, one stadium to the Minnesota campus and then back? Like for those, what was it, 2014 and 15, was it? Like what were what were some some unique challenges that you never really expected to face when you did that, you, you, under, you undertook that project? Well, the weather for one, I mean, we had a, we had a fan base that, uh, you know, a good chunk of our fan base had never been to, you know, outdoor football games for the Vikings, unless they were going back in the day at the Met, uh, which is now, uh, you know, Mall of America, uh, as far as that site goes. And so it was, a, a you know, educating our fan base on, uh, you know, how to get to the campus, where to park. I mean, it was a two-year uh, two years there, as you mentioned, you know, 14 and 15, knowing that the, the end prize was 16 and at U.S. Bank Stadium in a, in a new uh, world-class facility was, was motivating for sure. Uh, you know, some of those games, that playoff, last playoff game against Seattle was, was uh, incredibly cold. And so it was, it, was, it was an interesting situation. We played there once before when the roof collapsed, the Metrodome roof collapsed. Oh, yeah. So we, we ended up having, uh, I think it was three home games in 16 days in three locations, including Detroit. Uh, and so it, uh, it was crazy as far as, you know, the, the time was flying by, but uh, it's almost like we had the games, but our focus uh, from a business perspective was obviously you know, having a great fan experience and, and, you know, making sure that we did things right, but also uh, full focus on 2016 and opening the building that you only get to do really once every 30 years or so. And so that was a really special time. And you just alluded to something that I grew up remembering and now you just brought back an awesome memory for a fan to see that that ceiling that roof collapse was it, it, it'd be tough to say it isn't kind of cool looking but from business perspective like what went through the organization's head when that happened oh boy it, you know woke up early on on game day and it had collapsed you know kind of i think early morning hours uh, fox actually turned on a camera on saturday because they saw some a little bit of residue coming down so could goes to them for getting the footage and and luckily no one no one was hurt and uh and it was just a it was a crazy time it was you know full emergency mode within the organization to figure out okay i think the giants who were playing were were stuck in kansas city uh waiting to see where we we're going to play the game we ended up moving to detroit uh very last minute uh opening up uh you know no ticket sales just come on in as a as a nfl fan based in detroit to see an nfl game uh, and so that was a, a, a absolute whirlwind, 24 to 48 hours, and and certainly uh, I'd like to say a chapter in the book someday of of just a really unique experience, and that ultimately led to uh, I guess us building US Bank Stadium on the Metrodome site, having to sacrifice and play those two years at the U of M, uh, part of the journey. So you talked about building um, US Bank Stadium and the Performance Center too what was the experience like building those like from a business standpoint how like far back do you have to start planning these facilities and does the team success have any impact in a team's ability to actually build these type of facilities out well i would say team success never hurts any part of the business whether it's stadiums or bottom line revenues or ticket sales i mean winning always helps the business uh, part of the organization uh now it's a several year planning process. We have been trying to get a stadium, you know, ever since, uh, you know, Red McCombs bought the team in 1998. Uh, he had visions of building up in the Northern suburbs of Blaine. Uh, when the Will family bought the team, uh, there was uh, other locations, uh, sub suburban related, and, and eventually we landed on the, the Metronome site. So it's, it's, a, it's the largest private public construction project in Minnesota history. So obviously the public had a key financial uh, stake. And, and at the end of the day, the state owns the building uh, there's a third party that operates it and the, and the Vikings are the, the, the main tenant as well as all the other events that, that go on there, not necessarily in 2020, but hopefully back in 2021 that the full concert uh, touring business and, and, and related are back, uh, back on board. I, so I'm from Florida and, you know, back in 2010, 2012, the Miami Marlins built a publicly funded stadium and there was a lot of public pressure on them, especially when they made some moves player wise and the team wasn't performing well. What type of pressure did you face from a public standpoint, knowing that there was public 
um, dollars being spent. Was there any, or was it more just everybody was all for it because Minnesota loves their football? Well, they, they certainly love their football and love their Vikings, which is great. Uh, but at the end of the day, I mean, the public interest had to be protected. I mean, this is a multi-use facility. This is not just a Viking stadium. Uh, and really, at the end of the day, we had to design it so that, you know, baseball could be played at the high school and college level to obviously a, a world-class concert venue to all the other events that go on in the, the clubs and, and uh, public spaces. Uh, and so it, it was a definitely a, a balance between public and private. And I think we landed in a, in a really good spot that I like to say is kind of a, a win-win for everybody involved. So in 2013, uh, one of the first things that you kind of um, helped change, I guess you could say, for the Minnesota Vikings was they you, you kind of like a not like a rebranding, but you you redesigned the the jerseys and there was an enhanced Norseman logo. What was the process of getting that completed? And then what was the reception that the organization was trying to receive from the public? And what was that reception at first? Yeah, it's a, it was definitely a logo enhancement, not a logo change. I mean, the, the Norseman has been our, our mark since 1961 when the Vikings organization was established. It's very unique and iconic. And so we wanted to, to honor that. But when it was designed, that was, not, that was done before digital media and, and high def and 4K and you know, all the different technology platforms and, and social platforms. And so we wanted to be able to bring that Norseman to life a little bit more so in, in today's current element uh, even more so now versus back you know a handful of years ago uh, and so I think we landed in a good spot I mean at fans we were we didn't announce this major logo change again it was an enhancement and, and everything was very positive uh, our uniforms uh, you know we wanted to to you know modernize those uh, a bit and and make those reflecting of our historical look but with a little bit of a clean modern uh, edge so Nike was obviously very involved with that and and the league marketing department was also very supportive of us as we did our brand study and, and really tried to, to better understand our brand and what it meant and what it resonated with our fan base. And, and uh, so far, so good. Could you take me through that brand study? Because um, for one of my classes this year, my business and sport communication class, we, we took a look at Georgia's uh, brand study that they did throughout the 2000s. And they had... Um, they try to make their their brand and everything more universally recognizable. And they, they talked about all the way down to the font, to the lettering, to just the way the G looks. Like what, what goes into that type of meeting and discussion? Well, it's, 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 a, it's a long process. I mean, it's obviously a lot of stakeholders, uh, a lot of fan surveying, uh, focus groups, uh, a lot of experts that, uh, that know brands. Uh, you've got Nike involved. You've got the, the NFL league office. You have the the Vikings uh, marketing group as well. So it, we really tried to collaborate, uh, you know, drive the process, obviously leverage their, their expertise and, and resources. And, and obviously Nike can create some, some awesome uniforms, but we still wanted to stay, you know, keep the integrity to our, our history without going too far removed from it. Uh, and then we created the, the unique, you know, Vikings font that you see on the back with the nameplate and on how some of the letters and, and numbers really kind of seamlessly fit together uh, and we thought it was just a really cool look with, a, with an edge but not too much of an edge where we may uh, take it too far with your time um with the vikings went with being responsible for the branding and marketing of the franchise did you see a specific aspect of the team's brand grow from the time you took over to the time you recently um, wrapped up with the Vikings and you see a certain aspect of fan engagement or, um, you know, fan loyalty to the brand or social media following, like, was there a specific area where you saw the brand really increase? Yeah, I would, I would say that would be through our, our Vikings entertainment network, which is really an in-house broadcasting company. And that's all of our production and content, all of our social platforms. Uh, when I first took the job, obviously, you know, social media, you know, was not social media, uh, as it is as it is today and all those things kind of happened uh, over time and so we really tried to you know make sure that we we leverage that properly uh create the kind of content that our, our fan base wants to consume uh, you have to speak differently on each uh platform um to, to our fan base you know some fans are into instagram versus facebook versus snapchat whatever the, the example may be and so we we really tried to build a robust content production team and control our own content, create it, uh, have as unique content as possible. The fact that VN is based in our headquarters uh, building, 
right down the literally on the same level as, as the player's wing. I mean, it, it can be very interactive, respectful, but interactive of, of making sure the players know that, that we are not an outside broadcasting company. We are, are one of the family. So how can we help you uh, player with your respective brand? Uh, obviously player brands have become a lot bigger uh, over recent years and, and they have their own platforms. And so, you know, how can we partner together, reflect well for you as your personal as a player, as well as the organization, you know, Vikings brand. Uh, so I think that was really the main growth. And then obviously with U.S. Bank Stadium in 2016, we started uh, a number of new traditions, including the Skull Chant, which has uh, really been incredibly popular and successful. And, and I think something that will stay for the duration of the, the franchise into the future. Where did that come from, the Skull Chant? I think, I've, I, think I saw uh, my first time, uh, it was a European country. They had just come back from a soccer tournament and they had all, it was like a reception almost. It, it was in, I think Iceland or something. Yep. Like, was that, is that right? Yeah. All right, I, good. You did, did your research. Yeah. <laughs> Icelandic national team. So they, uh, we wanted to make sure that, that they gave us uh, approval or their blessing that, that we do our version of it. So we uh, approached them. Uh, they are very accommodating. Uh, they actually uh, engaged uh, quite a bit on it in, uh, and then off to the races, once we had that first game and we launched it and people started to get the feel for what this tradition means and, and how, how the rhythm of it goes. And, and uh, we didn't want to overuse it in games, but then use it at the right times to fire up the crowd. And, and so I think we've, we've really um, you know, landed in a, in a good spot again as far as uh, utilizing that uh, at the right times in the right places. And now it's, it's fans doing it on their own. And, and it's fun to see fans creating their own content around the Skull Chants and with the Minneapolis miracle and, and, and you know, what that meant to our fan base. And, and so we've, uh, we've had a lot of fun with it. Uh, and, and so I think that'll certainly continue to, to grow and expand in the future years past my tenure. What were some other stadium innovations that you had a hand in with us bank stadium? I know one thing was the smaller suites I've seen um, when marketing to the fan base about giving that more intimate experience um, where you could, where they could be with smaller groups of people. What were some of the other things that were carefully thought through when building the stadium? Yeah, there's quite a few things there. We have the turf suites, uh, you know, the field suites, which are literally on the level of the field. So your, your patio is the, the same turf that the players are, are playing on. Uh, and so that was a really cool uh, aspect for those that, that want that type of experience. It's not for every fan to be down low because your sight lines maybe aren't the best to see the action on the field, but you are right there especially if you're in the, in the corner. Uh, we have uh, the, the world's biggest pivoting door so we can uh, open those up and get the airflow, the, the, the clear ETFE roof. Uh, so on a day when it's 10 below in Minnesota for a December game or January playoff game, you could have that building enclosed, but on TV, if it's sunny out, it looks like you're playing outdoors. Uh, and so there's, there's a number of things. Um, our club purple with our, our there's a, a lounge suites that are actually couches. So you're sitting uh, on an L-shaped couch uh, for, for the game, kind of having a totally different experience and sitting in the seats. And, and so we really tried to uh, create some unique seating areas, uh, did a lot of research to see what fans were looking for. Obviously, I looked at other stadiums and arenas and, and what other teams have done in recent builds, what, what worked, what didn't work. Uh, but at the end of the day, we wanted it to be when you turn on Vikings television uh, or a game on television, it, you know exactly that's U.S. Bank Stadium. Uh, and then uh, when you come to a game, it's, it's, it's unique uh, versus any other uh, NFL experience uh, uh, in the league. Yeah. So when U.S. Bank Stadium hosted the Super Bowl, what was that experience like um, for you from a planning period? I see you have a Super Bowl helmet in the background. Yep. Um, and what was it like working with the NFL, working with Super Bowl sponsors? Justin Timberlake performed the Prince halftime show with the purple lighting up the city. So what was that whole experience like for you? Yeah, it was, it was awesome. I mean, it was a, it was a ton of work. It was, uh, to be honest, bit, bittersweet uh, because we lost the two weeks before to Philly in the NFC Championship game. We thought we could be, uh, you know, the first NFL team to, to play a home Super Bowl. And, and so that was, a, you know, on game day was, was a, a, little, a little awkward as we walked into our home building with, you know, the NFL branding and, and uh, not, not the Vikings branding like we normally have on game day. So, uh, but it was still special to be able to host. The, the community really rallied around and embraced the opportunity. Uh, we embraced the cold. We knew it was going to be cold. Uh, the, the biggest, uh, we used to say Armageddon would be if it was a, a, a warm streak that week. 
or weeks leading into because everything was planned for for outdoors and you know the kind of the frozen uh, activities and and uh, in, you know Nicollet Mall in downtown Minneapolis was was definitely rocking and and uh, you know game day was was great as far as you know how it all came off. The league was fantastic to deal with. Um, we have some conflicting sponsors, uh, so we had to work out you know how that worked. We do have some some corporate partners that that are similar, so that was the easy part of it. But uh, that happens in every NFL city where. You know, you're not always going to be in sync with league uh, branded partners and team branded partners. So you just have to find, you know, what's the, the right spot that, that everybody can live with. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's once every, I think the previous game was in 1992. So th those games don't come around uh, very often. So at least in Minnesota, they don't. So we wanted to make sure that we, we enjoyed the, the couple of weeks leading into it. The week of was, it, it flew by, you know, in, in hindsight, I would do things differently as far as, you know, planning your, your schedule and it was, you know, kind of tough to get around town like it is with, with every, you know, uh, NFL city on, on Super Bowl week. And so, um, you know, downtown Minneapolis was, was definitely a, a spot to be. Was downtown Minneapolis a spot to be, was it more of a spot to be after the miracle or during the Super Bowl? Well, the miracle, I mean, that, that, that's uh, anybody that um, is a Vikings fan or was in that building on, on game day, other than the Saints fans or the Saints team. I mean, that, that's a, a career highlight to uh, ha have that kind of thing happen to, to take you to the NFC championship game. Uh, the emotional roller coaster of any NFL game, especially playoffs is always pretty intense. And, and when you watch that game back and the lead changes in the last couple of minutes, it, you kind of forget at the time what, what happened, like, Oh my gosh, this thing was back and forth and back and forth. And yeah, a really, really special time for all of our staff to celebrate after. And, and then, uh, you know, very quickly, the team had to get focused on on Philly. Uh, when the media wanted to talk about what happened this past Sunday with the miracle, it, the football team was trying to, to get their focus uh, ahead to the following weekend in, in Philly. And so that's always, you know, a balance for the football team and operations. So in 2019, you were named the Innovator of the Year by Ticketmaster for your adoption and vision to completely digital ticketing. Where Where did that change and vision for you come from and is it somehow rooted in your days and how you started your journey and uh with the Pacers yeah I mean really you know the Vikings organization was, was named uh, Innovator and, and we fully you know Ticketmaster is a great partner they have been for for many many years uh we fully embraced mobile ticketing as we led into 2016 in our first state uh, season at U.S. Bank Stadium and our fan base uh bought into it. There's a lot of education. Uh, we had to make sure that when we, when we built, uh, you know, when we built U.S. Bank Stadium, that the right infrastructure from a connectivity, the, the Wi-Fi system, the, the DAS system, you know, making sure that your phone was fully capable uh, in mobile ticketing. Uh, we've been the, 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 the lead uh, leader uh, as far as the percentage of, of, of fans using mobile ticketing. Uh, it's really down to everybody except maybe a few that don't have a smartphone, um, believe it or not. There, there's some out there. Uh, and so it uh, is really more so an education standpoint. Uh, and, you know, back in my Pacers days, it was different. It was, it was paper stock tickets. You would send out to your season ticket base. You weren't really sure who was going to be the, in stadium on game day. Now with mobile ticketing, it's much better for the fan to forward and transfer tickets, uh, not worry about losing their ticket. Uh, and then at the end of the day, as they become part of our database and engage with the Vikings app, uh, we can start to, you know, build more, content and, and connectivity around who those fans are. And, and frankly, just who's in the building on game day is, is a huge benefit for teams now versus we knew who our season ticket base was, but at, at the end of the day, multiple months later, when you're playing the Packers in December, you have really no idea who was using that hard stock paper ticket. So it's, it's definitely, uh, it, it was time for, for uh, you know, teams to move to that. And we were in the era where we could have the technology and, and backbone behind it to make sure it works. And obviously it doesn't work when you weak Wi-Fi or, or your, your mobile phone because there's no DAS antennas for the cellular players. And so uh, we, we nailed that as far as, uh, you know, putting the right uh, investments into that and, and didn't minimize that at all. Over your tenure with the Vikings, did you ever see a change in your season ticket holder demographics? Was there ever a change over the 20 years of fans, you know, age range or, you know, types of people that were going to the games? Were there ever significant changes or has it always kind of been a steady baseline um, demographic? 
I'd say it's a little bit of both. You have your traditional uh, fan base that were, that were there back, um, you know, back in the, Met, uh, the old Met stadium days to Metrodome uh, before my, my time in 1998, when Randy Moss hit the scene as, as a rookie, uh, their 15 to one season, uh, that was a, a, a definitely a growth in the fan base uh, uh, to a, to a younger fan base, uh, maybe, maybe first time Viking season ticket owners. And then I think the next change came when we went into our new stadium and we now have, you know, clubs that are all inclusive that are uh, on the 50 yard line, you know, stacked up. We tried to create as many first rows as possible with multiple levels uh, versus just two concourses like uh, the Metrodome had uh, bring those sight lines in, in as tight as possible, uh, not have the biggest video boards in, in the league, but have uh, the best clarity and the best aspect ratio and best viewing angles uh, to really be able to be impactful, but not a distraction uh, to the fans on game day. Uh, and so I think over time, there were a couple, the, the 98 team was certainly uh, evolution from our fan base. And then uh, 2016 was as well. What was it like when Brett Favre came to the Vikings from a marketing perspective? It was fun to, to go to bed at night and wake up the next morning and, and find out how many tickets you sold overnight <laughs> online was was crazy. So it, uh, I mean, the, the, the media frenzy, uh, you know, very unusual to have a, a border battle, you know, type of thing where one guy switches teams to the other border border battle team. And uh, it, it was interesting. There's a lot of uh, Packers fans in the Twin Cities. There's a lot of families that are split between Vikings and Packers based on where they grew up. And so it made for some interesting uh, times for sure. I think, you know, some Packers fans weren't sure if they were supposed to like the Vikings now, still like Brett Favre, not like Brett Favre, still hate the Vikings. So it was just, it was a mixed bag, but we, uh, we definitely had, had, had a lot of fun. And, uh, and, you know, there's some, some great early wins that, that season, very close last second type things. And, and then obviously the, the heartbreak in New Orleans and in overtime uh, was, it was a tough one. That was a, a long uh, plane ride back. Now that your time is over with the Vikings and you look in hindsight, um, you touched on a couple of moments, a couple of uh, games, but w- what for you personally was the most rewarding moment during those 20 years? Well, it's hard to put it on, on one moment. I mean, there's the, the on the field highlights when you win or, you know, have some type, you know, Minneapolis Miracle is, is one of several examples. I mean, that kind of experience and adrenaline rush is, is hard to, to, to replicate. Uh, to building a, a, a team that, is best in class in so many ways across the sales and marketing departments and, and to see people have, have success. Uh, you know, we are, uh, you know, very steady organization, great fan base, uh, super proud of, of us bank stadium and what that means from a fan experience and the, and the revenues that we generated obviously are, are key to the bottom line that drive, you know, other parts of the business, uh, and can impact, you know, football investments and those, those kind of things, uh, to then hosting the super bowl to, you know, opening up, a TCO Performance Center in Egan. Uh, you know, it's, it's hard to put it on just one thing. So it's really a, a journey of, of, of many things that uh, it was fun to be part of and, and proud to be part of. What um, is the toughest aspect um, in working in the sports industry, in your opinion? And what do you enjoy most about working in the sports industry? Well, the sports industry, it's, it's at the end of the day, you can't really, if you're on the business side of, of the organization, you, you can't truly impact uh, what happens on between those white lines on, on game day across any sport. Yeah. Your fans can be an advantage. If you can get your fans to be louder and prompted that can, you know, help the team on the field. That certainly is key, but uh, you can't necessarily, you know, block that punt or, or return that, that, uh, you know, kick for a touchdown kind of thing. So it, you know, I think Mondays in, in the NFL after a loss are, are tough. It's tough on the whole organization. You only have, you know, 16, uh, soon to be 17 home uh, total games, you know, half of those being at home. And so it takes a little time to kind of shake off the, the uh, regret from, from the loss. Uh, whereas in baseball, you know, obviously you're playing multiple games over multiple nights and in home stands and those kind of things. Not saying that a loss is any less to them, but it's just, it's just less maybe impactful to the overall record. Uh, the, the best part of it is, is this, it's, it's a great industry. It's growing. Uh, obviously uh, people care about our brands. They, the, uh, they're, they're passionate about it. Uh, you know, I say all the time, your enemy from a front office is apathy. You want your fan base excited or anxious or, 
maybe upset that you didn't draft the right guy in the third round, but at the end of the day, it pans out. Uh, and so different things, you, you know, the emotion is there, uh, uh, both working for the team as well as those associated with the team. And, and, uh, and it's a lot of fun. I and mean, we're in the entertainment business. We have to remind ourselves sometimes that uh, we're in enter entertainment and, uh, and this is a key part of, of a lot of people's lives. And obviously, uh, like I said earlier, you know, winning is, is always, is always good and fun, but it, it doesn't, you're not going to win them all. That's for sure. If you could go back and tell, um, 2021 year old Steve LaCroix something after all these years you've had, what would you tell him? It's, uh, I, I say this all the time and it sounds kind of, kind of quirky, but, uh, I wish I would have kept journals, like written everything down over the, you know, the, the stories and the experiences and, and everything's, you know, uh, up here, you know, some's on paper. Uh, but I just think that, uh, you know, over 30 years and at the Pacers, we were playoffs nine out of 10 years, NBA finals, uh, once and playing Kobe and Shaq in LA and, and, uh, just, you know, the, the experience of, of, of various uh, road trips over the years and, and uh, corporate partner trips and, and was able to visit every NFL venue uh, over, over the years. And, and so it, um, you, you kind of have your favorite parts about certain buildings and other, uh, you can't afford every best practice when you build a building because you run out of money. And, and so it, it's not like, it's like building a house. You can't, you can't opt in on, on every upgrade and option. Uh, but no, I, I would say it maybe as, as, as surprising as that sounds is just, uh, wish I would have, you know, documented things more so uh, over time for, so for those getting into the business, just maybe that's a little tip to, I've never been a journaler or, or you know, diary guy, but, um, you know, just kind of keep things a little bit more organized so you could reflect back on paper versus, uh, you know, just kind of in your head as far as from the memories. So to take a chance to, for you to reflect, what is your favorite non-Vikings venue that you've ever attended or just been to, whether it's during a sporting event for the Vikings or just completely uh, detached from your responsibilities? Uh, definitely Augusta. I mean, it, it, uh, I've been fortunate enough to have been there a handful of times and it's, it's a special magical place. And, uh, you know, it, uh, you know, was able to take my, my son Alex there and, and, and then take them to the NCAA basketball championship the following night. Uh, and so it's just one of those where, um, you know, Augusta is a magical place. Went to many Indy 500s uh, over my 10 years and uh, with the Pacers, that's, that's a special weekend and a, and a special uh, race day. Uh, you know, MLB all-star games, you know, just uh, the last 19 Super Bowls, uh, the streak will end uh, this year. So been the last 19 Super Bowl weekends and, and, you know, each city has a different personality. Each building has its own personality. Uh, and so it was able to do a lot of really cool things that hope to continue to do in the future. What was your favorite? Well, going off of that, then what was your favorite Super Bowl you've been to in the last 19 years? Uh, none of them. Cause we, we weren't in it. We, we didn't win. <laughs> um, no, I mean, every, every weekend's different, you know, there's, there's a, uh, whether it's the, the, the game experience where you sat that game, you know, what parties you went to, obviously Super Bowl week and weekend is all about the, the various corporate and celebrity parties. And, and so, you know, I, I soon I learned along the way that, that you don't need to go to every, every party. And, and it's just like, you really find the right ways that you can uh, be there representing the Vikings network. Uh, it's a time when uh, the industry, the, the, uh, all the partners, uh, really, you know, collide into to one city. So it can be a really efficient uh, time over the course of those days to, to, to get business done or at least lay the groundwork for business. And, and so that, that's something um, certainly uh, great about it. And oh, another event I didn't mention is Kentucky Derby. That's another oh, that's cool. bucket list wise for those that haven't been is, uh, is, is a fun time too. Um, so I have two final questions for you. Um, so one of my questions is I saw you were involved with the Nashville MLS expansion team. What was it like working with an expansion franchise? Cause there are so few opportunities to ever do that. Yeah. I mean, that was unique for, for me and for the leadership team of the Vikings. You know, we had just in recent years, obviously built and opened our, our new stadium. Uh, the Will family is part of the ownership group. Uh, and so uh, we wanted to make sure that, that we were there to assist the, the Ingram family and the, and the majority ownership group to, to get off to the right, right start, you know, lean on us for lessons learned. Uh, you know, eventually uh, they brought in uh, Ian Air, their CEO, and he built a team and, and they've broken ground 
at the fairgrounds of Nashville and, and Nashville is one of the best city in the country, uh, in my opinion, um, as far as, so we wanted them to be uh, successful uh, in a league that uh, continues to be successful in a city that continues to, to grow. And, and, uh, and that was a lot of fun to be part of that, to be the, the uh, consulting mindset at the table uh, was, was something that I really enjoyed and, and hope to do uh, more in the future. That's awesome. So my final question before Jack closes the podcast out is what is advice you'd give to Iowa students who want to either break into the sports business, whether it's sales marketing side or on the journalism content creation side? Yeah, I would say, you know, study the industry, uh, do your, do your homework. You know, that sounds easy. Uh, Create a robust network. Uh, Our sports industry has become very specialized. And so in the past it used to be you're in marketing and you kind of do a little bit of everything. Now it's, it's become uh, very specialized. Uh, uh, there's a lot of online resources that, that are free. That's just, you know, again, do your homework as you, as you interact with those in the sports industry, uh, try to get some real life experience on campus with the, with this athletic department back in your hometown with the major or minor league team or, or smaller college, and just kind of learn the uh, ins and outs of, of events in, in, in the sports industry and see what really clicks and, and whatever your passion is, uh, just chase that and, and, and go for it versus trying to be a generalist, uh, you know, maybe to get in the business, uh, be a specialist. And then over time you can grow within the industry and, and uh, oversee multiple areas. I have, I have one final question. It, it has to do with, um, it has to do with being a part of like change and being a part of like, or taking advantage of the passion you have. And one of the things that I'm really passionate about with sports is the ability for sports to be a platform for whatever topic to be discussed. Um, this past summer, the passing of George Floyd was a really um, touching story for the entire nation. And it happened only three miles away from the stadium. And the Vikings were one of the first organizations to really uh, take a, a stance, a forefront stance to the story. And they, um, like I'm pretty sure they donated $5 million to social justice causes and as well as they created the George Floyd scholarship. So what does it mean to an organization to um, take such a, a st- not like, you know, what I'm trying to say, like, take a stance and, and, and be in front of that story and to be a leader for their fans in the community to look to, because it, it, in that situation, I really feel like a lot of the nation uh, didn't know what to think and the Vikings were one of the first to act and act as a leader. Yeah. I mean, it's something where uh, we had already set up a social justice committee with, with uh, players and coaches and, and some front office leaders. So it wasn't like we had to ramp up and, and, and get a group together. It, luckily things were already uh, established and in motion. Uh, our players uh, felt very passionate uh, about uh you know, making sure that we use the Vikings platform to, to raise more to the issues and take a stand. And, and so it was something where the whole organization from, from players to coaches, to front office, to ownership all came together to uh, try to make a difference and, and bring light to uh, societal issues. And, and uh, certainly, uh, hopefully um, it was something where, uh, you know, it was helpful to uh, whatever way that we can make it helpful. And, and obviously other teams, uh, had, had other issues in their respective cities or other ways that they wanted to handle it. But I think the, the Vikings uh, did an excellent job uh, at the time in a, in a very trying time uh, to uh, do the right thing and, and make an impact. Sam, do you have any other questions? No, um, no, he answered everything I had. And thank you so much for taking the time. I mean, a lot of Iowa students were excited to hear this podcast, seeing um, someone who, got to be um, a part of two really, you know, well-established sports organizations. Um, I've had friends in the sports rec program, friends in the journalism program, friends who are engineers who are all excited to hear this podcast. So I really appreciate you taking the time. Thanks guys. Appreciate the opportunity. All the best in uh, 21 and go Hawks. Yeah, go Hawks. Or stay safe and to all of our listeners, uh, you know the drill, not the same time, same place. We will see you guys later.